putting brain scans in the hands of everyday psychotherapists who were not trained as neuroscientists. And we'll see if it makes a difference. And I'll tell you what's come out of it. I think it's actually been of more use to the researchers so far than the psychotherapists to see how they react and how far we as researchers need to come with our field to make this clinically applicable. But getting ahead of myself. This work has been supported by a number of organizations, primarily the National Institute of Health, and I have no conflicts to talk about. Why try and integrate neuroscience and psychotherapy? The first huge reason is that we're talking about severe problems. The problem of unipolar depression, it's still the most expensive disorder we have according to the World Health Organization. It is the number one leading cause of missed days from work. It's fatal, and it breaks up families and jobs. Our best treatments are inconsistent. They, they work for the best medications and the best psychotherapies we have work for about half the people we give them to. So as Dr. Greenfield has suggested, when you talk about the weather, we'll often say, um, or the often quoted observation about the weather may be aptly applied to talking of a more rigorous approach to the conceptual problems of psychopathology. Lots of talk, we really need to do something about this, but not a lot of doing. And that's still kind of applicable. We're working on getting these rigorous conceptions of psychopathology. The other big reason, though, we think biology can help. In Dr. Greenfield's words, the traditional separation between functional and organic disease is, or at least should be, an anachronism, which has done much to obscure the problems of disease. Perhaps joining these together will give us more purchase than either separately. This work, of course, is not work I could do alone. It involves clinical trials and brain scans and psychophysiology. So we've got all the people who actually collect the data and do the work I'll be talking about. We've got a host of collaborators who really helped form the science over the years. Particularly, I'll highlight Michael Face, who's been very involved in the depression work I'll talk about, Cameron Carter, who has been very influential in the kind of fMRI work we do, and Stu Steinhauer with the psychophysiology. And then our dedicated group of clinicians who are every day treating our patients, in this case using cognitive behavioral therapy, whose work I'll be telling you about. Roadmap for today. Talk just a little bit about depression and what might change as people get better. And then see if we can translate basic insights about brain mechanisms of depression to the clinic in two ways. The first is, if I know who has these brain mechanisms, can I say who would respond to treatment? The second is, as I mentioned, if we then take that information and put it in the hands of our clinicians, would they treat their patients differently? And this will be, can we get to individualized neuroscience-derived assessments that work on single subjects that would say, here's what you do next with your patient? So where to start? This is Wisconsin. You guys invented the idea that emotion and cognition are inextricably linked and might be related to brain function. I don't have to tell you much about it, but I will just point out when people get depressed, they're very sad. It's an emotional phenomenon. There are lots of negative th thoughts that go with depression, thoughts of worthlessness, guilt, thoughts of death and suicidality, difficulty in con concentrating. There's lots of reasons to believe these are very strongly related to one another. Depression has lots of other symptoms, which I won't talk about so much today. So these emotion-cognition interactions we'll concentrate on. More formally, given positive and negative information, the depressed people will think more about the negative information. They'll better remember the negative information. They will interpret just about all of the information as negative, and then they will ruminate on it on the time scale of minutes to hours or even days. So you hear the... Um, puppies, they pee on my carpet is the interpretation, and that means I'm a bad person and I'll never do anything good again. How could this work in the brain? If you believe people like Joe Ledoux, information comes into the brain and it's processed in parallel by areas like the amygdala, which assign an emotional valence to it. Yeah, that's good or that's bad. And then the areas like the hippocampus, which are associated with retrieving information in episodic memories. That is to say, you hear the word birthday. Birthdays may be good or bad, depending on how old you are. And the hippocampus says, I remember what I was doing on my last birthday. There is a lot of feedback between these. So my last birthday was terrific, which makes me happy, which makes me think about other happy things, which makes me even happier. Now, 
think about something negative, I hear the word death and I know somebody who died in a car accident, which makes me sad. What could rumination be in depression? It could be this feedback loop, very strongly going and going. It could be this area is very active, very good at recognizing things as bad. Or it could be I'm very strongly connected to some negative memories. In any case, you've got this feedback loop kicking. Healthy people should be able to then shut it off and say, gosh, I want to think about something else and get on with my life. Ideally, areas like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex should, in Dr. Davidson's words, initiate an emotional, emotion regulatory cascade. That is to say, it might not be directly connected to the amygdala, but it should at least say, gosh, this is my executive control area. I want to think about something else. And through connections to areas like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which does both self-referent processing and proximal inhibition of the amygdala should ideally help to shut down this ruminatory cascade. Now, these aren't all the brain areas that are involved in depression. There are far more. These aren't all the functions of these areas. All of these things have lots of functions. This is the story I'll tell today because we've got limited time and I want to get on to treatment. So we've got four brain areas on which we'll kind of concentrate mostly on two. The amygdala says, gosh, that's bad. Ideally, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex should initiate some regulation and help you to stop saying that. So far, so good. I would have loved to be the first one to tell you that when you see something emotional, the amygdala is very active when you're depressed. Yvette Shalene and I submitted our papers at the same time she published first, so I'll show hers. You, show, you see emotional faces. The amygdala is very active in the depressed compared to not depressed people. At the same time, that's not yet saying it's a very sustained activation. To do that, I'll use a simple task. Show you an emotional word for a fraction of a second. And I can ask you any question about it. What's the emotion, or is this relevant to you and your life? And then I'll wait for 12 seconds or 10 seconds and say, what in the brain turns on and stays on? And see if it's the amygdala. See if the prefrontal cortex comes on to regulate that. Yeah? All right. So the re approach will be to identify these brain regions associated with depression and then say, did they predict response or change when we gave people therapy? Everybody I'll tell you about is an adult. We have depressed adults from 18 to 58 years old. They got 16 weeks, um, 12 to 16 weeks of cognitive therapy. And I'll tell you about cognitive therapy later. Um, everything I'll tell you about, I want to make sure it doesn't just work in one sample, because if it works once, it might not work the next time. So I'll try and tell you about things that work three times 